chapter two. Let's take a look here. It's important to know the difference between uh, revenues and expenses. So we know that revenues are income. Any money that's coming into an entity, a school, a university, that's the income. It's the financial support generated from within or without the institution. It could come from taxes. It could come from tuition, uh, private donations, all that's revenue. It's allocated, collected, and it's donated for a specific purpose, which makes it restricted. It can only be used for specific funds. Cannot be used willy-nilly for everything. Uh, examples of restricted funds are grant funds or student fees. So student fees have to go toward the thing that it's paying for. So if I charge student fees for paper, it can only go to paper. If I have grant funds for students who have a 2.5 GPA who live on the west side of Chicago, I can only use it for those particular funds. So state appropriated funds, of course, are uh, the primary source of income for most public universities, Chicago State being one. County and municipal funds can be included, but the lion's share comes from the state. Formula can be uh, base funding, and I'll move myself out of the way here. Line item driven or institutional budgeting. It's good to go with line item budgeting because then it's uh, one, more difficult to cheat, and two, uh, a lot safer when an audit occurs. You can find the funds quicker if it's line item driven. And then the constitutional autonomy. So other state agencies cannot regulate universities with this status. So if you have constitutional autonomy, UIC or University of Chicago or uh, um, city colleges can't regulate what Chicago State does. So state appropriated funds. So a private university gets fewer state appropriated dollars because they're private and many private institutions have the wherewithal to not need state appropriated funds. Um, the capital budget support can come from state to private institutions to benefit students with grant funding. Um, so if a student needs help for tuition funding, a student can get capital budget support from uh, the state or private institution. In a perfect world, we know tuition be, would be the main revenue source. That's not always the case, though. Some institutions cannot survive only on uh, tuition. So the taxpayers have to kick in funds to, to add to that source. Private schools model this, however, public schools rely heavily on state appropriations. If Chicago State just relied on tuition, it would be very difficult for us to survive. So we have to uh, pray and we have to hope that the governor of the state is uh, fiduciarily responsible enough to uh, divvy the funds to Chicago State so that we can survive. If you look at Vermont and Virginia, public education is supported by tuition and less from its taxes. Private school tuition, I'm gonna make myself real small here, you guys. So with private school tuition, governing board sets tuition in private schools. There's a board that says the tuition should be $30,000 a year or $40,000 a year. Uh, in private schools, the tuition is based on the market. It's based on prestige, competitors, and private realm. So Harvard, Princeton, Yale, the board pretty much can charge what they want for tuition uh, based on their prestige and their reputation. Other schools can't necessarily do that because if you're, if the market, the prestige and the history and the reputation isn't uh, deemed as um, formidable, as excellent, as upper echelon, then it's going to be hard to uh, demand a tuition that is high because you could just simply choose to go to another school. 
So here's some of the graduate school burdens. It's a double-edged paradox because grad programs attract faculty, students, and research fellows. With graduate programs, well, okay, we know that undergraduate tuition drives a school's revenue, but graduate research fellows, graduate students, and graduate programs give the college prestige. So one gives you money, the other gives you prestige. More prominent programs make money. So if you look at Notre Dame, uh, their MBA program makes a lot of money because they don't just offer the MBA program on their campus. You can, you can get a Notre Dame MBA in Chicago taking courses downtown. Uh, the Wharton School of Business is very similar. Grad programs are a necessary component. Uh, if a grad school breaks even, it's all well and good because it's about alumni dollars, prestige, and research funding. The undergraduate tuition and the prestige of the graduate programs will automatically attract more students. So to ease the tuition, ouch, public schools may keep tuition costs reasonable, uh, but you've got the F word, fees. Th these can be charged to offset um, tuition is not always a good idea though because if your fees go too high if they're increased too much students become uh, upset why am I paying all these fees what are these fees for these fees that I'm paying aren't going toward my education tell me what they're for so you have to be careful as a college president or a college board uh, or a provost or business uh, consultant, be careful with charging students fees because if they do not go to the fund that the fees are supposed to pay for, students uh, and their parents can become uh, skeptical. So fees are charged for what? Building, technology, recreation, labs, etc. Private schools are seeing major advantages here by charging fees to offset drastic tuition hikes. So I may choose not to increase my um, tuition for two or three years, but if I hike up my fees, sometimes that's a hidden cost that no one pays attention to. So endowment income. Ah, beautiful word. I'm going to move myself around here, you guys. Investment income from the institution's endowment is endowment income. So the endowment is really isn't to be touched. That's money that's considered savings. It's to be invested. It's not to be used as ready cash. Uh, income from the investment is used to support the yearly operating budget of the institution. Public schools are shifting toward better investment alternatives by using more proficient outside firms to invest the capital. And this is the key right here. Only a percentage of investment income should be used for yearly operations. Um, you know, three to 5% max. You don't really wanna go over that or else you don't have an endowment. You've got petty cash. In order for an institution to last for decades, for centuries, you have to have an adequate endowment in case there's a rainy day. choice on endowment income. So the central budget allocation is to all units, individual unit endowment funds dedicated to support of the specific unit. Divide the university endowment by the number of current students or undergrads. This gives you a glimpse of the school's economic position. Uh, and I've got some examples. Harvard, Chicago State, Fisk, Northwestern, they all have different endowment ratios and uh, we'll be doing some calculations in class on some endowment ratios and you'll see exactly what we're uh, what we're talking about there student fees are special one-time fees are for participation in a program or activity I'm on the college speech team uh, I may have to shell out $25 for copy materials 
uh, for the entire year of speech and debate. Fees for services or funds that benefit the student's well-being, including health care, is a fee. Psychological services, that's a fee. And social functions. Uh, hey, I like parties on campus. Occasionally a comedian or a concert may come to campus. I may get a discount on that because I'm a student. Uh, what takes care of that? My fees. Annual giving, we got to work on this at Chicago State. The health and wealth of an institution is in if the graduates of that institution choose to give back to the institution. Do the alumni choose to give a hundred bucks a year, $250 a year, a thousand dollars a year to the institution. That's how you gauge the health and the wealth of an institution. You've got annual giving, focused giving, and campaigns. Of course, annual giving is yearly. And then you have focused giving. Focused giving, you may get a phone call from the track team. Track team says, hey, how are you? We understand you ran track when you were a student here. Can you give $200 to the track team? That's focused giving. And then you have campaigns. So with campaigns, these are much more robust. Campaigns are for facilities and program initiatives. Campaigns can be used to raise funds for buildings. Do you want a new library? Do you want a new gym? Uh, they can be raised for endowed chairs. Mm, we want to have uh, Shonda Rhimes come to campus to be a visiting scholar for one or two semesters. That chair has to be endowed. Uh, do we want uh, a faculty member who is a history professor and economics professor to be in that position for a sizable period of time? We have to endow the chair campaign funds can do that. Also scholarships, fellowships, and centers can come from campaigns. We want to build a center of perception relevance or we want to build a center on um, discrimination and politics. That center can be funded through a campaign. So a campaign funds, campaign funds can be used for Hence the word substantial and specific items. Grants and contracts. So state agencies, the federal gov and businesses and private foundations provide grants. They can fill the gap to direct or indirect costs such as accounting, purchasing uh, utilities, etc. Time limited arrangement with a business or government entity whereby the institution provides a direct service in return for payment. It's wise sometimes to have certain line items under contract because if they're contracted, you don't always have to pay for health insurance uh, or certain liabilities because of the contract. Should you contract janitorial services? It depends. If you do, you don't necessarily have to pay health care for the contractors, uh, but you may have to pay a higher wage per hour. Whereas if you have built in um, custodial services, you, you more than likely have to pay for the uh, health care and the benefits for that, for that, uh, for that full-time employee. Auxiliary services, talked a little bit about this in class. So an auxiliary service is um, expected to generate income. It can be come in the form of dormitories. Students pay for dormitory in the form of fees and a uh, room. So we have room and board. Room, of course, is the dormitory. Board is the food in the cafeteria. Student unions recreational programs and sports. Those are all considered auxiliary functions. We have contracted institutional services in the form of bookstores, food service, custodial services. We also have branding and content ownership. Everything that the school licenses, patents, and can charge royalties for, those are major content revenue streams for a university. 
So no one should be using the Chicago State logo of a cougar uh, without Chicago State's permission. Here's an example of uh, content ownership. Northwestern University Chemistry Department, they developed the drug Lyrica in their chemistry department. So Dr. Richard Silverman and postdoc students um, decided to uh, sell this drug to the open market. Um, of course, Lyrica, an anti-seizure drug, is used widely now. It's in all the pharmaceutical uh, entities. Uh, doctors prescribed Lyrica, and Northwestern University collected uh, hundreds of millions of dollars for that. So that's branding and content ownership. Uh, Northwestern pretty much owns the patent on Lyrica. Expenditures. $400 billion is spent by universities. This dates back to 2008, though, so it's closer to $600 billion now. Lots of money to be made in universities. Two-thirds is spent by public institutions. Most institutions are public, such as Chicago State. Salaries are the single largest expense in budgets. Wages and benefits are considered encumbrances. So benefits, we know what those are. Salary expense with a set percentage going to benefits comes out of every employee's check. There may be stressors on this budget due to family number and size of families increasing. So if you're paying for the benefits of one employee uh, with no spouse, that's one line item. But if you have an employee with a spouse or partner and they have five or six children, they have to max out their health care benefits, which can also be a stressor for universities. Unused balances and unit benefits can be rolled into a central budget at the close of the year. Revenues and expenses. The balance of these two are at the heart of a university's solvency. It's very important to know those two words.